so bhavik would uh, can you start with the introduction please yeah uh, so good evening all and uh, i think we are meeting after a long time uh, and i have been assigned a task to introduce uh, rashmi so many of you would know rashmi personally but uh, Uh, as the decorum of this uh, group is maintained, I would like to introduce Rashmi. So Rashmi is a fellow member of ICI, and she is also a registered valuer under two forty seven of the Companies Act, under Section two forty seven of the Companies Act. And uh, further to that, she also holds international certification in banking and risk management, facilitated by the Global Association of Risk Professionals. in terms of her uh, work career she was associated with pwc bank of america and crisil which is snp for more than 9 years and post which she has ventured into a valuation practice and which is now a decade old practice uh, so she specializes mainly into valuation space and conducted valuations for uh, many listed companies uh, banks financial institutions private equity funds and she is also an active participant in icai activities uh, she was in fact a, a technical study group of the valuation standard boards of icai and was also involved in drafting icai valuation standards uh, she has also authored several articles and publications including handbook on the valuation which is published by uh, the chamber of tax consultant and uh, she also is a faculty uh, at various seminars and conferences held by uh, professional bodies like asocam icai icsi so with this uh, i will hand over the proceedings to rashmi rashmi over to you hope to have an interactive session yeah thank you bhavik thanks for introducing me uh, so yeah good evening good afternoon to all the members who joined today and yes we are indeed meeting after a long time and the topic that we've selected for today is uh, basics of valuation of convertible instruments now why the use of word basics because it's a vast topic and uh, you know i don't think there is an end to how many interpretations and how many instruments we could have and you know how many structures we could have for the same instrument so for this session we'll stick to the basics and hopefully we'll have uh, you know more sessions where we can deep dive deep, di deep dive you know into more concepts and uh articulate it in a more detailed manner so yes in today's session we will discuss what the basics of convertible instruments are you know uh, in the first 30 40 minutes we'll discuss what are the types of instruments uh, under the convertible umbrella what are the key features and terms which can affect the valuation and after that we'll you know go through some case studies we'll explain as to you know what terms can uh, be interpreted in which manner and you know how can we value those kind of instruments and yes hoping uh, uh you know to have more questions and um, inputs from all the participants present today so to start with uh, you know what are convertibles i am sure we all know we all are practicing uh, uh, you know day in day out on valuations and we are valuing such instruments but still for the benefit of all of us present here they are basically hybrids okay they are hybrid securities they have characteristics of both debt and equity now if i am the holder of this instrument i get the right to convert it into another security uh, of the same issuer or it gives me the right to convert it into common shares or equity shares of the issuing company now most securities or most convertibles uh, convertible bonds or preference shares they will pay you regular interest and they can be converted at a later date convertible securities uh, generally will also have embedded options uh, like you know say call or put options now if i was to convert a security a convertible instrument from one security type to the other so say i have a convertible uh, bond and i want to convert it into equity shares in this case we have to assess what the conversion features of the security are and this will uh, mostly be you know similar to the value of the uh, uh, stocks call option and the value of equity shares so um generally why we need a special discussion on this is because it's more complex you know valuation of convertible instruments is more complex than valuation of say a non convertible or a, or a straight security or a plain you know vanilla security why because they have features they have features which are different from normal say ncds and they combine features of both shares 
as well as fixed income securities. The market value of a convertible debenture uh, therefore will depend on you know what the conversion terms are, what's the conversion value, what's the market price of the ordinary share, uh, what's the value of the straight debenture, uh, etc. So yes, to process uh, and derive at the final value, we need to go through uh, the terms, the features of the instrument that is getting issued and finally arrive at the value. Uh, essentially, we work on two types of, uh, you know, convertibles in a practical scenario. That could be a convertible bond or a debt or a convertible preference shares. And then there are optionalities uh, into it, uh, which can make it an optionally convertible debt or an optionally convertible preference share, or it can make it compulsorily convertible debt and compulsorily convertible preference share. Okay, so these are practically the most uh, acknowledged, used and visible uh, instruments, at least in my personal experience. And at the end of the session, we can hear from you as well as to what kind of securities have you all valued other than convertible bonds and preference shares. So like we mentioned, bond is again, it's a hybrid security. It has debt and equity features. Uh, a convertible bond or a convertible note or a convertible debenture. It's, it's, it's a bond that the holder can convert into specified number of shares in the issuing company. As a bondholder, it will give me the right to exchange this bond for a known number of equity shares in the issuing company. So thus, it can be viewed as a combination of a straight bond, straight bond meaning a bond which, uh, you know, without an, a, an option of conversion, plus an embedded equity call option. Okay, and then it can have uh, added on to it features like call provisions, uh, put provisions, etc. So as an investor, from my perspective, a convertible bond is said to provide me more benefits and security in comparison to a non-convertible plain vanilla bond. Why? Because firstly, it gives me the right to participate in an upside that can be available to equity holders and the share price appreciation upon conversion. Uh, now say, you know, in a scenario where the conversion does not happen, even then I am protected to the extent of at least getting the coupon uh, payments on a regular basis and repayment of principal at the end of the tenor or the date of maturity. So this, this also means that even if the value of the call option and the share price falls, the value of the convertible will never be lower than the value of the straight bond. Okay, so the value of the straight bond here forms a floor for the value of a convertible bond. So some agreements may have terms which are relating to condition of share prices, so say the bond can only be called if the share price exceeds a specified price. Now, as an investor, this also gives me, uh, you know, a view on the share price at which I can be asked to convert. As an issuer, uh, so, you know, as an issuer, what are the benefits? The benefits are that, you know, uh, they are able to offer convertibles at a lower coupon because there is an upside also involved. So then there is reduction in interest cost. And also because of the conversion feature, the overall debt level is reduced. But of course, there is an effect of dilution when the conversion happens. Uh, like uh, convertible bonds, there are convertible preference shares. Okay, They also include an option for the holder to convert the shares into a fixed number of equity shares at a predetermined date. And uh, this again uh, is based on the performance of the common stock. Okay, Both of these instruments can have embedded options. Uh, within it, which can give some more power and authority to the issuer or the bondholder. So within convertibles, like I said, we have, uh, you know, um, a wide variety of convertibles. From For this perspective, we will be focusing on compulsorily convertible and optionally convertible instruments. However, there are many more instruments which could be issued, you know, by corporates, depending on the kind of structuring they want to have. So we'll discuss them just to have an idea of what they are. From practical purposes or from case study purposes, we will focus on a couple of such instruments. All right. So various features of these convertibles, you know, they can make it plain vanilla. It can make it mandatorily convertible. It can make it reverse convertible, optionally convertible, etc. So let's discuss what these instruments are. So vanilla convertible. What do you understand by this? So this is the most common convertible uh, that you know you can actually find. So in this type of convertible, the holder can uh, either he can redeem uh, at par, or he can choose to convert it into equity shares. 
Now, of course, this will depend on the stock price, which should be above the conversion price. And that is when the whole conversion will happen. The conversion price of these bonds are generally known in advance. And these bonds will also provide uh, interest or coupon at regular intervals for the life of the security till it matures. The cash flow pattern of a plain vanilla bond will generally be known and it is fixed in advance. The second one is compulsorily convertible or mandatorily convertible security. Now, as its name is suggesting, it will definitely get converted into equity shares at maturity or earlier, whatever is you know, mentioned in the terms of such securities. The third one is uh, optionally convertible. Again, as the name suggests, you have an option. You can either convert it or you can redeem it. Okay, so it is uh, structured as a bond plus option and we can value these type of securities as a straight bond and a call option so generally this is the the you know the equation that we follow when we have to value optionally convertible securities then we also have contingent convertibles so it's again a variation of compulsorily convertible securities with contingent provisions. Uh, they are also nicknamed as POPOs and they get automatically converted if some uh, event or uh, you know a, a pre-specified event triggers or happens. So uh, while a traditional convertible bond is converted at the option of the bondholder and conversion occurs if the you know share price of the issuer increases, in the, the bonds which have contingent provisions, uh, they are generally decided based on already uh, or, or you know mentioned terms or specified events. So bondholders can actually be forced to you know bear some loss if they hold COCOs because the conversion is not at the option of the bondholder here, but it is automatic. So if something happens, your bond gets converted. And because of this, COCOs could generally have a higher yield than other bonds. A reverse convertible uh, bond or um, you know, also denoted as an RCB. It's a bond that can be converted to equity, debt or cash at the uh, wish of the issuer. Okay, So here it's not as per what the bondholder wants. It's as per the discretion of the issuer at a predefined date. Now the issuer here, he has the option to either redeem the bonds in cash or to deliver a predetermined number of shares at the date of maturity. The reverse convertible bond will give the issuer the right to convert the bond's principal uh, into some uh, shares at a fixed date, and, and there is always a put option embedded with it. The last one, again, could be commonly uh, considered is a foreign currency convertible bond. So they are basically bonds whose face value is issued in a currency different from the issuing company's domestic currency. So they are generally FCCBs or foreign currency convertible bonds. Just like how we have options, there is also a moneyness of convertible instruments. So is anybody aware of what the, the moneyness, um, you know, options are? What kind, what, what do you understand by moneyness uh, in options? Have you heard management speaking that, yeah, we are mostly going to redeem it. We are going to consider it as debt. And, uh, you know, we don't think it to be equity. Yeah, right. So it is, it is, it is uh, you know, pretty much uh, that, but it, it just carries different nomenclatures. So the first one is equity-like or in the money, you know, where the, it's more, uh, what we say, more tilted towards getting converted. So when you say that it's more equity-like or in the money, it means that the convertible is said to be uh, in the money when the share price is above the conversion price and the chances that the conversion will happen are extremely high. So it has high probability of getting converted. Then there is balance where there is an equal, you know, 50-50% chance of getting redeemed or converted. So it's called balanced or at the money. So the convertible is said to be at the money when the share price is trading very close to the conversion price and the likelihood of the conversion happening is equal. The third is 
more influence towards getting redeemed. So it's a bond like or out of the money uh, scenario. So the convertible is said to be out of the money when the share price is below the conversion price and the conversion year looks little unlikely. Okay, so it may not happen. Finally, a distress scenario, but that is a scenario where, you know, the share price is extremely, it's, uh, you know, at a very discounted price. It's much below the conversion price and the risk of default of the issuer is extremely high. So it's likely that even he, he may not even get his coupon and uh, principal payments. So these are the four uh, sections of moneyness when it comes to convertible instruments. Okay, it can be equity-like, debt-like, balanced or distressed. Now, why we, why we need to understand these categories? Because when you have to choose a pricing model for convertible bonds, you need to understand which, uh, you know, which of the four walls it fits in. So these four categories have a particular importance when you have to choose the correct pricing models because it can have some pricing error if you are, you know, uh, for an in the money and out of the money convertible bond. Okay, so when we, you know, when we value some instruments, generally what kind of data do you ask uh, from the management or from the client? Anybody, y'all can put in the chat box, y'all can unmute, y'all can speak, just feel free. Yeah? So what's the kind of data you would generally ask? Okay, conversion terms, right. So I think apart from other things, the, the, very, the very important thing when you're valuing such instrument is the terms of the instrument. Hmm? The what, why, where, when, how of the instrument is extremely important other than the general and other you know, common data that we usually ask for. So you know, when a company issues a convertible debenture, it will clearly specify the conversion terms. Now, conversion terms will indicate how many equity shares in exchange for the convertible debenture will you get? Now, what price uh, will the conversion happen? And, uh, you know, the time when the conversion option can be exercised. So generally, the terms of the agreement will state the conversion ratio or the conversion price. So yes, first important element is conversion price. Conversion price is the price at which the convertible security can be converted into shares. Okay, so the price at which you can convert your security into shares is con called conversion price. It is essentially, uh, you know, the price that will be paid per share for acquiring the shares and exchanging the bond. So in exchange of the bond, what are you, uh, you know, the price that you pay is the conversion price. Any other term that you can think of? What other terms do you generally see and use while you are valuing instruments? Okay, lock-in period, conditionality of conversion. Anything else? See, I already, I have to value a bond. Okay, now to value the bond, what are the things that I will need? Will I need uh, its tenor, its, you know, the coupon? Will I need the conversion ratio? Yeah, you may need fair value of equity depending on if you're valuing an optionally convertible or a CCPS, call option holder. Okay. Yeah, so there are, there are various uh, things that you will require. After conversion price, there is something called as conversion ratio. Like I said, the terms will mention at least one of the two or both. So conversion ratio is, again, the number of shares that the investor will receive at the time of conversion of bond into equity shares or the number of shares the investor receives against each bond, okay? So they, it's generally, you know, one is to one, five is to one, two is to one, something like that. That's the conversion ratio. So it's the number of ordinary shares that an investor can receive when he exchanges his convertible debenture. We'll discuss it in more detail. The next term is the conversion value. So it's basically a derived formula. It's the current share price into the conversion ratio, that's the conversion value. Then we have conversion premium, conversion parity, the coupon. Coupon is very important because if you want to assess the redemption features, you will surely need it. 
the face value. This is also very important to know what the face value of the instrument is, the final conversion date, and the redemption or maturity. Okay, the conversion date can be different from redemption or maturity. So these are generally the the key terms. But yes, if you have instruments <clears throat> where you know which are contingent or which um, have too much optionality or they have too many payoffs, then you will have various scenarios also which will be built into the terms, which the management will generally structure it in the terms itself. Okay, so like I said, conversion price is the price at which the security will be converted into shares. Conversion ratio is the number of shares that the investor will get uh, at the time of conversion of the bonds. And the conversion ratio is uh, the number of equity shares that the investor will receive when he exchanges his convertible debenture. Okay, so the number of ordinary shares per one convertible security is called the conversion ratio. Okay, now in some cases, the terms may or not may or may not mention the conversion ratio, and they may only mention the conversion price. So in these cases, how will you derive the conversion ratio? If you have the conversion price, you have the power value, then how will you derive the conversion ratio? Can anybody tell me? So say power value is 100, conversion price is 20. So what is the conversion ratio? One is the five. Right. Okay. Conversion ratio right. divided by conversion price. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, no conversion uh, value or yeah power value of the debenture divided by conversion price also gives you the conversion ratio. So if you're in this example, if the current share price is fifty, uh, and the conversion ratio is um, sorry, if the power value is hundred and the conversion price is twenty, then the conversion ratio is hundred divided by twenty or five is to one. What does this five is to one mean? How many shares will I get for every bond that I'm holding? For every five bonds, you will get one share. Okay, anybody else? The power value is 100. The conversion price is 20. The conversion okay, ratio, it's, it's, it's actually the reverse. You will get yeah, five yeah, common so. shares for every bond. Okay. So this is how you can also get conversion ratio. If you have the power value, okay, and the conversion price, you can calculate the conversion ratio. In all of our FEMA reports, it's important to uh, mention the conversion ratio or the conversion price. Most of the time it's available. At times when it's not available, you can compute it. Uh, finally, the conversion value, we did conversion price, we did conversion ratio. Now conversion value. So um, uh, studies also say that it's called as the parity value. Uh, so the current share price, when you multiply it with the conversion ratio, we get the conversion value. So the conversion value of a convertible instrument, uh, it is equal to the conversion ratio multiplied by the equity shares uh, price or value. So now if the current share price is 50 and the conversion ratio is 5 is to 1, what is the conversion value? If my current share price is 50 rupees, the conversion ratio is 5 is to 1. What is the conversion value? It will, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Prashant? Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, so it will be 50. How did you get it, Prashant? 50 multiplied by 5 because the conversion ratio is 5. Yes. Okay, so in, in other words, the conversion value is actually the money worth of the convertible debenture if it is converted into equity shares today. That is the conversion price. Now, after we did uh, conversion value, conversion price, etc., what do you think is conversion premium? So premium is the difference between the convertible bonds price and its value. Okay, so convertible bonds price minus conversion value gives me conversion premium. So say, for example, the value of the bond or the price of the bond is 400 rupees and the conversion value that we just computed is 250 rupees. What is the conversion premium in this case? 
Yeah. Okay. So it will be 150 rupees. So that gives me the conversion premium. Uh, so conversion parity, then we come to the next concept called conversion parity. Now this will tend to happen if the convertible bonds price is equal to the conversion value. So if the bond price is equal to the value, uh, the conversion value, it means that the conversion is, uh, you know, it's at par or it's at, it's having parity. So using the previous two examples, so say the current share price is 80 instead of 50 rupees, then both the convertible bonds price and the conversion value, they become equal. Okay, they both become equal to 400. How? 80 into 5, that's the conversion ratio. So 80 rupees into 5, that is 400. That gives me the conversion value. So there is now no conversion premium and the conversion premium is equal to zero. And this condition is referred to as conversion parity. If the common share or the stock is selling for less than 80, the condition is below parity and the reverse of it. That is, if the share is selling for more than 80, then the condition is above parity. Okay, are we all clear till here? We'll then go on to the coupon. Coupon is very simple. We all, uh, you know, used it. It's uh, it's a periodic interest payment, which is paid to the convertible bond holder by the issuer. And it could be fixed or variable or zero or even very nominal. We all would have seen it's 0.0001% and, and all of that. Okay, so that's the coupon. So what does the coupon indicate? It indicates the amount the issuer is promising pay, to pay to the bondholder each year in interest. Now, the market discount rate will generally reflect the amount the investor needs to receive an interest each year in order to pay full par value for the bond. Okay, we all would have under, uh, done or used XIRR, the XIRR of the bond. Okay, so that's the rate which we would generally expect to get the full par value for the bonds. So that is the XIRR. It could be different from market interest rates. It could be different from the coupon rate. So they are different concepts. Face value is the starting point of the bond. It's the notional amount of any instrument. So uh, that's the face value. Final conversion date uh, is the date on which the principal or the par value of the bond and all the remaining interest, uh, uh, that's the redemption date. So final conversion date is the date at which the holder can, you know, uh, actually request the conversion into shares. So when I want to convert my uh, bond into shares, that's called the conversion date. And this could be different from the date of redemption because the date of redemption is the date on which the principal or par value of the bond and all remaining interests are due to be paid. All right. Finally, yeah, that's the redemption date. Okay. Then there's one more concept, uh, which is not mentioned on this slide. It's the redemption value. So the value that as a bondholder I get on maturity is called the redemption uh, or maturity value. And a bond can be redeemed, you know, either at par, at premium. At premium means it gets more than the par value or at discount, which is less than the par value. Now, why these concepts are important? Because when you go to value, uh, you know, mixed rates like OCDs, for example, there you will have to value the bond as a straight uh, bond or a plain vanilla bond and plus value of the option of the stock. So that is why you will require the, the cash flows to get the value of the instrument as if it was going to get redeemed. So these were key terms. We'll just see some of the exit scenarios uh, in which cases the conversion could happen. Okay. Now, this is may or may, or may not be very uh, relevant from a valuation standpoint, but uh, we can still see that, you know, what are the various, uh, you know, scenarios under which a conversion could be required or forced or uh, done. The first case is default. So, of course, if there is a default, the bondholder will get an amount uh, based on the uh, ranking or the seniority of the bond uh, in the in the capital structure of the company. And of course, uh, in this case, I don't think any conversion happens. So whatever the bondholder holds, that is what he gets as per his ranking or seniority in the capital structure of the business. Second is optional conversion. So where the investor is deciding to convert into shares, or without any specific event or trigger or a call notice or anything. 
that is optional conversion. Third is forced conversion. So if as an issuer, if I ask, uh, you know, if I am forcing the investor or asking the investor uh, at a predetermined call period, then that is a forced con uh, conversion. So technically what happens is the issuer can give a call notice to the investor about the call, call action and the investor can decide whether to convert after the call or not. But if the investor converts the bond, uh, under forced conditions, it's a forced conversion. Next is conversion at maturity. So now the bond has not been called, put nor converted before maturity. And only at maturity, the investor chooses to convert the bond into shares. That's called as conversion at maturity. At times, many terms also specify that, you know, in the first three years, no conversion can happen. And at the end of 10 years, only the conversion will happen. So in those cases, the conversion is definitely at maturity. Then we have redemption at maturity. So again, the bond has not been called. It's not been converted. And at maturity, the conversion value is, you know, even below the payout of the redemption amount plus the coupon payment. In this case, uh, we all remember, we saw that uh, interest plus principal, the present value of these two items becomes the floor for any uh, you know, convertible bond as well. So in that case, redemption happens at maturity. So when the conversion price or conversion value is much below the redemption value, the redemption happens at maturity. Conversion does not take place. Uh, put and call, we all know the bondholder can put the bond back to the issuer at the put price as per the specified period. In the call, the issuer can call the bond back from the bondholder, okay? And the bondholder is not going to convert the bond. So these are some of the exit scenarios. In some scenarios, it gets converted. In the others, it gets redeemed. So from here, we'll go to the case studies. Uh, uh, but before that, we'll just see the, the, the theoretical aspect of the valuation approaches and techniques. Uh, so straight bonds, as you all know, they are valued using the uh, discounted cash flow analysis. One second. So valuation complexities, uh, they are definitely uh, there because of the characteristics of the bonds and the, the rate that you have to use for discounting the cash flows. So as valuers, we need to understand that certain important aspects about the uh, you know, bond, which includes the features of the bond or its scheduled cash flows, the terms of redemption and conversion, uh, the relevance of optionalities uh, available to the holders and the issuers and any contingency provisions involved, which could affect the scheduled cash flows of the bond. The first thing is valuation of straight bond or plain vanilla or a non-convertible debenture. How would you value uh, an NCD? It's a straight, it's a it's a straight bond. There are no conversion features, you know, um, no fancy uh, terms attached to it. So how will you value it? There's a bond with this much coupon expiring in five years or rather maturing in five years. How will you value? Okay, we have interest. We have principal, which will be redeemed, say, at the end of the term of five years. TCL, that's right. Yeah, so in, income-based approach using discounted cash flows analysis. So value of a non-convertible debenture or a straight bond or a debenture without an option of conversion can be arrived at by discounting the future cash flows, which are composed of coupon payments and repayment of principal at maturity. Now, what will you discount this at? You will use a risk-adjusted rate of return. Generally, in your experience, what, what is your discount rate taken as? How do you compute the discount rate? How do you get the discount rate? The guideline is there, right? From the? FIMDA guidelines. FIMDA guidelines, okay. Using CAPM, okay. But CAPM, do you think will apply so much to uh, valuing your debt instrument? Okay, let's discuss this at the end of the session. But yeah, any other sources for a similar debt instrument? Right, risk-free plus premium. Okay, yes. Yeah, so FIMDA generally is the most widely used approach when you have access to FIMDA, okay? At times, uh, 
uh, you can uh, take for similar instruments like uh, what generally can be done is you know take listed securities and then add some premium to it because your instrument is probably unsecured and unlisted okay so you can do that as well third is if your coupon is already in the range of general market rates okay so say 12 to 14% or 10 to 14% then you can take your coupon to be same as the interest generally you will get par value as your answer at uh, you know in those kind of cases right so you will always use a risk adjusted rate of return you will assess your instrument you will use a rate that can be considered to discount these kind of cash flows the value that we get is also called as investment value okay so the investment value will be uh, equal to the face value of the debenture if we have uh, you know if we assume the uh, interest rate and the required rate to be the same and the redemption of the debenture to be at par so the market discount rate or the rate of return which an investor is expecting considering the riskiness involved with the bond is used in the discounting uh, of the cash flows or the time value of money calculation to get the present value of such cash flow so we see that it's extremely easy to determine the present value of a bond uh, without any conversion features because its cash flows and discount rate can be determined without too much of difficulty or complexity um in general uh, the the second case would be minimum value of a convertible bond so you will see that it is the max of its straight value or the conversion value it cannot go below the equation that becomes your minimum value of convertible bond okay so in general parlance the minimum value of a convertible bond is the higher of yeah is the higher of the conversion value or straight or redemption value now if you were to invest in a non callable uh, non puttable convertible bond it's actually equivalent to getting an option free bond and a call option on an amount of the equity share uh, equal to the conversion ratio so the, generally the, the equation that you will use to value a convertible but a non callable bond is the straight value straight value means value of a straight bond plus value of call option on stock so that is how you will value a non callable but convertible bond but some convertible bonds they are callable which means that the issuer can call the bond prior to maturity now if we are to incorporate this feature also in the above formula then we have to adjust for valuing value of a call option on the bond okay so see there's a difference so we have straight value of bond plus value of call option on stock minus value of call option on the bond and not the stock okay if there is a put put feature also involved then we will add the value of put option on the bond so that gives me a full a uh, full drawn equation of a option of a convertible bond which has both call and put options involved in it how you value call option on bond you can do it using binomial methods mostly generally everybody uses the binomial method to get a you know uh, uh, to run the iterations and get the value of call option on the bond so a bond that is both callable and convertible will have two embedded options call option on the stock and call option on the bond and the investor will generally have a short position in the call option on the bond why i marked it yellow is because we are not considering this for our case studies we will be considering the above two examples only for the for our further case studies okay so because in uh, practical life yeah somebody is speaking yeah hi hi this is harshil here yeah, so ha so one uh, would like to discuss, uh, you know understand something Uh, yes. So, so if we can discuss, then I can only you know intervene. Else, maybe you can continue. Uh, you want to discuss it now? Or yeah. Later? Uh, yes, yes. I wanted to discuss it now since we are discussing this slide. So, I have a point where I have issued a uh, a preference set which is optionally uh, redeem con optionally convertible, okay. and uh, that is redeemable. Right, that is redeemable as well. Optionally convertible and redeemable. Yeah. Both are there, and option is with the issuer. option is with the issuer with the issuer okay 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 right now convertible at the at the time of uh, the the fair value will be determined at the time of conversion okay mm -hmm. okay 
so it's it's a fully variable uh, instrument uh, and uh, uh, the it is classified as liability in financial statement so that is not a point but uh, we wanted to understand how to determine the value of an option because uh, uh, the uh, excess uh, the 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 price of the conversion is in future yeah then the fair value will be determined at that point of time yeah. right so when i consider a binomial option right so i have uh, five or six inputs which are there one is risk rate of return dividend yield uh, strike price exercise price and uh, you know tenure and all that thing mm -hmm. and volatility so i have to determine the uh, the, the you know on the input like strike price exercise price volatility volatility actually anyway i can you know determine some on some historical what, what will your exercise pre price be in this case what are you taking your uh, exercise price as so that's what i wanted to understand how to determine exercise price we don't know at which price it will be you know uh, converted but uh, this uh, conversion ratio is variable Hmm. Then this is not fixed, right? Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> how to do, determine that exercise price in this case, and uh, what should be the strike price and all that thing? Okay. Can... So, this is my view, okay? And others, I'll be happy to hear from them. See, here the option is with the issuer actually, it's not Correct. with the bondholder. Correct. That is what I heard from you. Yes. So, yes, in yes. this case, the value of the option becomes negligible or zero, okay? Because it's not with me as a bondholder. And the mm -hmm. option to convert is lying with the issuer. So do you really think there is value of option? And if there is no value of option, then why do you want mm -hmm. to use binomial, etc. methods? And second is whenever anything happens at FMV, like we'll do it at one of our examples, that will, that will I think, pretty much take your case. Okay. So we will see one of the case studies. And I think then we will discuss this at the end of the session as to what we can do. okay yeah. okay and then just add to it if i am doing a valuation from the whole issuer's perspective because i am doing a valuation from the issuer's perspective okay so what so so how do i bring the value of option in that case okay so this also we will discuss okay whether the perspective yeah. really matters here or do we need to be neutral when we are doing valuation of an instrument okay. yeah i think right. we need to be neutral we cannot take a particular stance or a perspective we need to see what the instrument is serving to both parties and what is the risk of the in instrument per se on a standalone level so that also we will discuss at the end of the session all right we'll take views from everyone on that because my view could be different than what others are doing currently yeah All right? no problem thanks yeah okay so in practical life most convertible bonds will have uh, additional features like a contingent conversion uh, or a or a putability so that's basically a bond holder can uh, give the convertible bond back to the issuer or a callability say the issuer can enforce the call of the option by paying some uh, early redemption so we ha may have to include these features when we are uh, preparing our models or uh, obtaining our valuations of these instruments. Okay, so there are some features uh, uh, of options like say to convert into stock, which are convertible bonds, uh, to call back the bonds, that's callable bonds, to put back the bond to the issuer, which is uh, putable bonds. Now, some of the options are available with the issuer of the bond and some can be available with the holders of the bonds. Okay, so option pricing models can be used to value these uh, fixed income securities or uh, special features of these securities. A conversion option is generally like a call option on the underlying stock and its value can therefore be determined by variables which will affect the option values as well, right? Like Harshil just mentioned, you need those six variables. So yes, you will need six variables for these, uh, for valuing call options. That's the stock price of the underlying. The strike price, which is determined by the conversion ratio, the life of the convertible bond, the variance uh, in the stock price, and the, the risk free rate or the interest rate. Now, like any other call option, the value of the conversion option will increase with which all features? Does anybody remember? Which of the variables will increase and therefore the option value will also increase? The value of the conversion option will increase with which two to three features or which two to three characteristics or variables? Tenure, volatility, and exercise price. No, stock price. So if price of the underlying stock 
variance and life of the conversion option increases, then the value of the option also increases and it will decrease with the exercise price. Actually, exercise price will have a reverse effect on the value of a call option. Uh, it would have been different if it was a put option. So the terms of the instrument, they play a very important role in determining the value of the convertible. Uh, in some cases, the, the, the terms could be so complex that, uh, you know, I mean, of course it is structured and we need to take care of all the nuances as per the terms. But at times it could be important to take what the management's intent is, you know, what are they preferring to treat it like based on their projections, what do we think is the probability that some trigger event might happen? So there are many ifs and buts, which makes this whole exercise very, uh, you know, subjective. But at the same time, the terms play a very important role in determining the value of the instrument. They'll give you the details of the size of the issuance, the face value of the instrument and conversion options of the instrument, the co coupon terms, redemption schedule, whether it's compounded annually, quarterly, on a simple or compounded basis. And of course, it will have details of the security of collateral as well as trigger conversion features. So we'll take case studies now, okay? And if you think you all can do it in a, a different manner compared to what I am, I am showing or presenting here, then you can also uh, explain it to the, the group present over here. So the first is valuation of a CCD, okay, with no specified conversion ratio. How do you think you will value this kind of an instrument? It's a compulsorily convertible debenture. There is no specified conversion ratio. Okay, what do you think or how do you think you will value it? Okay. So, yeah, so we will take the value of equity, which you can compute the way you want it. That's per market cost income market approaches. Okay. And to that, you will have to add the interest, which has not been accrued on such CCDs till date. So all the, uh, the interest component, uh, the valuation of the interest component, plus valuation of equity component. And this method is called the sum of the parts method. So these are the terms uh, of the CCD. The life is five years. Coupon is 12% per annum. Conversion ratio is face value of the CCD divided by FMV of equity shares at the time of conversion of CCDs. So not right now, we don't know what the FMV is. It's at the time of conversion. Face value of CCD is rupees 100 per CCD. The number of CCDs are 1 crore and the total issue size is 100 crore. How do you think you will value this if I have to go with the first formula? Simplicity apart, you can always run a Monte Carlo simulation because you don't have FMV at this point in time. So you can run a MCS model and you can try and obtain 1000 iterations to get what the FMV can be at the time of conversion of the CCDs and you can obtain the value in that manner as well. Okay. So the question is, do you need to reduce the dividend? <clears throat> so see, at this moment, we are not reducing because right now we are doing valuation of only the interest component. So CCDs are convertible instruments. That is, they are debt instruments, which will compulsorily get converted into equity at a future point in time. The formula for the conversion, the time of conversion, and the terms and conditions for conversion, they are majorly uh, guided already in the CCD agreement. Now, fair valuation practices require CCDs to be valued as per any internationally accepted pricing methodology for valuation on an arm's length basis. So the popularly used method to value CCDs is some of the present value of the interest component and the present value of the equity component of the CCD. Now, in this particular example, we have considered life of CCD to be five years. Coupon here is 12%. The conversion ratio is not fixed. Okay. And it is mentioned uh, that it will be, sorry, I'll just go back. Yeah. It is the face value of the CCDs divided by the FMV at the time of conversion. 
So we have determined the value of the interest component by plotting cash flows of the CCD towards interest over five years. Now we then need to discount it using an appropriate discount rate. We can, we have discussed this, but uh, we can, uh, you know, again discuss it. We can compute this discount rate by adding corporate bond markup to the risk-free rate. Okay, so either we take the risk-free rate and we add corporate bond markup or else we can directly obtain it from the corporate bond yield matrix for bonds with different rating and maturity, which usually you can get from FIMDA. FIMDA, the, the, it's a fixed income money market and derivatives association of India, which um, releases on a timely basis corporate bond yield matrices for different uh, for bonds having different maturities and ratings. Okay. I've also seen that you can also get the same data on Bloomberg. So we can then make, you know, certain specific adjustments pertaining to the liquidity spread, sector spread, issuer specific spread to arrive at a risk adjusted discount rate, which can then be applied to determine the present value of the interest component. So this part is important. Anybody wants to say anything? Otherwise, yes, yes. So I so just wanted to understand that liquidity spread to uh, sector specific spread and issue specific spread. Uh, is it not covered under this corporate bond market uh, markup based upon ratings? Because like okay. issue specific spread is is hmm. a part of credit rating adjustment, right? That we are already making that adjustment so into three point two five. Yeah, yeah. But this uh, what we say the the you know the 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 corporate bond markup that we are considering. That's for a company or for those a set of corporates which are listed A plus. Yeah. Now say I am doing something for an unlisted company which is a private player and may not be as large. So for that I cannot assume the risk to be the, the same. You know, I, I say it's you know it's a real estate company and it has more risk involved. I may adjust for just you know covering up the other inherent risks which are very specific to my company alone. So, so, but, but what happens that, you know, uh, uh, like if, if the listed company is having a credit rating uh, A plus, for example, and I'm doing the, you know, valuation of the company, which is privately placed and it has a credit rating of A plus only, right? So okay. Even though in, even though in those cases, we have to make this adjustment because, you know, the query, the question here is that how do we quantify, right? Yeah, there is, there is, that is the question that, that it's a subjective element, just like how we add company specific risk premium for under CAPM as well. So there are also, there is an element of subjectivity involved. And that's why I said we can make certain specific adjustments to arrive at the final discount rate, okay, which can be applied. But that is again, a, a, the value as professional call. If you think that your A plus matches and it's up to the mark of the A plus of the overall corporates that has been considered by FIMDA, then you very well may take, but then, you know, you just need to be sure that, uh, you know, you're filling, you're fitting in the same bucket and there is no other risk, which we are not capturing. Right. So it's optional. Anything below 9.88% here is your call as a, as a valuation profession. We can take 9.88%. You least. could take. Yeah, you, you can take, but then what you are doing is your coupon is 12%. And mm -hmm. you're taking a risk or you're, you know, discounting it by 10%. So I think that will give you a value much above par. Okay. So, uh, if for, a, for a bond, do we need to make any adjustment for liquidity spread? Yeah, because what I'm valuing for is a an bond. Yeah, I'm valuing, uh, valuing a non-marketable, you know, uh, a, ball, a bond which is, you know, not trading on exchanges. It's not listed. And it is unsecured. It's not collateralized as well. So... So going by those assumptions, yes, you may have to do something for its liquidity as well. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is the value of interest component. Then we'll do valuation of the equity component. Okay. So since the conversion ratio is dependent upon the fair value of equity shares at the time of conversion, what we are doing is we are creating two scenarios. Now in the first scenario, okay, I'm taking equity value per share as of the conversion date. So say it is increasing to 200 rupees from 100 rupees. So what is the conversion ratio here then? We remember what the conversion ratio is. Face value of the CCD, that is 100, divided by fair value of the share, that is 200. So it gives me 0.5 or 5 equity shares for 10 CCDs. 
so so actually I, i'm sorry to inter, uh, yes. know, interrupt here so mm -hmm. actually the real challenge for all of us or maybe at least for me is that uh, you know how to determine a value per share at the time of conversion yeah that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying when you get a clause that your shares or your ccds will get converted as per fmv of shares there is mm -hmm. no challenge because whether the price of the share goes up or down your conversion ratio yeah. will only change what you ultimately get the ccd holder mm -hmm. ultimately pursuant to the conversion whatever he gets remains the same that's 100 crores so that is what i have tried to show here we built two scenarios say it increases to an x amount and it reduces to a y amount so at max what will happen my conversion ratio will change okay now in the first yeah. case my conversion ratio is 5 shares for every 10 ccds yeah so, so basically the, yeah basically hmm. what will happen that uh, number of shares will get changed the the the, the settlement amount would remain same yes that's right okay so the settle, settlement amount remains the same so irrespective in both cases the total value of equity shares which will be issued to ccd holders after the conversion remains the same so the present value will therefore be uh, as computed below it's 54.28 okay and uh, the total value of the ccds is then this the value of interest component that is 42.21 crores plus value of equity component that's 54.28 crores uh, why 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 we are not giving any impact for value of option in this case because it's compulsorily converted there is no element okay. of option I mean, there is okay. no optionality. It will definitely get converted. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Now, then we have another case. So somebody was asking me why dividends, whether dividends have to be considered. We will now see that scenario over here. So, in this particular example, we have specified conversion ratio. Okay. So, in this example, we have considered life of CCD to be five years. Uh. the coupon is 12% and the conversion ratio is mentioned at 1 is to 1 it is not dependent on fmv of the share at the time of conversion 1 is to 1 is as of any time as of today also so whatever the value of the share is that is the value of the ccd as well okay so the conversion ratio in this example is fixed at 1 is to 1 which means that one equity share will be issued against one ccd now we have determined Uh, again you can see the other terms here which are mentioned there is one thing called as dividend yield as per management or as per historical data that is 2% now why we are considering dividend because the conversion is fixed over here so we will have to say that as of today if my share i am not converting you know if i am not converting my debt then what is the component of dividend that i am foregoing because of not converting okay so here we've done the same thing same exercise we have determined the value of the interest component by plotting the cash flows of the ccds towards uh, interest over 5 years now since the conversion ratio is fixed we have made the adjustment for the dividend that is foregone by the ccd holders until conversion we have then again discounted this using a, a, a risk adjusted discount rate that we've already uh, discussed in the first example and then we can assess the value of the equity now what do you think will happen here the conversion ratio is 1 is to 1 so what is the value of the ccd here is the value of equity says right so because uh, the value since the conversion ratio is 1 is to 1 the value of the ccd will be exactly equal to the value per share okay so the present value is uh, so if you see the first slide we were saying that the current value of equity share is 120 per equity share so that same value has been assigned to the ccd as well so this is the value of ccd in this case or you will see it's 158.69 rupees per ccd all right anybody does anything differently other than what was explained here then happy to discuss maybe we can take it at the end of the session we'll take an example of an optionally convertible debenture okay so we did a ccd with a uh, flexible or you know with an unknown conversion ratio then we did with a specified conversion ratio of 1 is to 1 now we'll see a valuation of optionally convertible debentures okay so what is so peculiar in optionally convertible debentures 
you have an option to either redeem or convert. That is the only peculiarity it has. Ma'am, I had a question on the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, so what we did was we added the current value of the equity share for mm. valuing the CCD. So, uh, but the shares are going to be converted at the end of the fifth year, right? So, uh, why aren't we taking the fair value of equity at the end of the fifth year and then discounting that back today? Because I get the point that if the current value is 120, which is given, but then those are going to get converted at the end of the fifth year. The FMB at the end of the fifth year can be different, right? It can be, but you're, you're doing the valuation as of a specified date or say as of today. Since you're doing it as of today, you are saying that today, if I convert, I will get one CCD for one share of 120. So that is why valuation date becomes important. If you're doing something today, you're hypothetically assuming that conversion to happen at one is to one. So that becomes the value of your equity component and CCD as well. But then uh, for uh, taking today's value, I can at any point of time discount it, uh, right? So. So we, as of today, we don't know what would be the FMB at the end of the fifth year. So maybe we'll have to run simulation in but that case. We are case doing and discounted then... only. Huh? Because we have not shown how I got 120. You're getting confused, right? I've used your DCF method only to get 120. I have taken cash flows of five years and I've discounted okay. it to present value. It's not a straightforward case. 120, my friends, has come through your cost market income approaches, whatever is applicable to your company. You could have a used a CCM method, a market price method. You could have used a DCF method or even NAV method. Okay. 120 is not a straightforward figure. It's your value per share that you have obtained by arriving or by doing certain procedures that we normally do to get value per equity share of a business or a company. All right. right so absolutely. But then that, isn't that activity to be carried out at the end of the fifth year when the shares are going to be converted? I got your point perfectly, but then shouldn't that activity be done at the end of the fifth year because FMB at the end of the fifth year is to be uh, converted? But conversion ratio is fixed, no, Mihir. It's fixed at one is to one. At any point you do, it is one is to one, irrespective of your per share value. It's not dependent on FMB at the time of fifth year. It's a fixed okay. conversion ratio. It's not okay. dependent on my five years. Okay, 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 understood. Yeah, that's why the difference difference in approaches for of you know a flexi and a fixed conversion ratio. Okay, so in year two, when I go, I again do this uh, fair value of equity as, as of year two, and then add the PV of. Uh, it, everything is as of today. It's nothing is as of year two, year three, year four. We are not building different scenarios. Yeah, this right. is not what then, the terms are demanding. As of today, what is the value? As of now, right, what is I the value? To, I'll have to value it again at the end of the next reporting period, right? So that, that is, point of time. That becomes your as of that time then. That so if day, your yeah, next okay. reporting period is after one year, as of that date, whatever your value per share is, that becomes That's your one is to one. Period. That has to be applied over there. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. How will we value OCDs? Value of option plus value of conversion. Conversion. And how will you do value of conversion? We will use some option pricing models to get the value of the option for conversion. Okay. So in this case study, we have OCDs and they have a redemption as well as a conversion option. So we'll just see the terms. So these are the terms. Uh, there is a conversion period given, uh, then there's a method of conversion. Okay, <clears throat> the redemption option is also given that if the holder of the OCPS uh, fails to convert the preference shares, then it will be redeemed at uh, on 30th September 2030 or any time earlier by mutual consent. The price of the OCPS is can be redeemed at a premium of 1990. Okay, whereas the equity share base value is 10 rupees. Okay. The premium is 1990. So while the redemption option is straightforward and uh, it will come from the cash flows of the OCDs, uh, it's the conversion option that needs to or which needs, um, you know, more inputs and more hard work. 
So in, in these cases, the value of the OCDs can be computed as the value of debentures upon redemption plus the value or, or, or you know, of the option for conversion. Now, equity valuation, again, it will be based on the generally accepted valuation methodologies. Once the equity value is obtained uh, using the various applicable valuation you know, approaches and methods, we can run the Black-Scholes or the binomial model by entering the various inputs. So the value of the debenture uh, in the debt-like form can be computed using a uh, DCF model based on the cash flows of the instrument using and discounting it with a discount rate applicable to that debt instrument. And in this case, if we have to build a Black-Scholes model, I'll go back. Hmm. What do you think is the exercise price here? $2,000. Right? So $2,000 becomes my exercise price. I'm assuming, I, I mean, I have arrived at the current value of the underlying at 1800. The risk-free interest rate corresponding to the expected life of the stock option is six and a half percent. The expected volatility in the value of the underlying asset is 20%. Now the risk-free rate, expected volatility all have to be uh, obtained or, you know, from sources or computed. Life to expiration of the stock option is 10 years. Dividend yield? is zero then it then other things are okay you know the valuation date the conversion date so here i have two parts first is the option value that is part a i'll tell you how we got 840 so that is report rupees 840 and then we get the npv per debenture using the principal value uh, and the coupon that i'm getting as 100 rupees number of ocds are one crore so the value per ocd is 940 rupees so we'll just see how we got 840 and, you know, uh, other elements. Sorry. So this is value of the redemption component that you will get using some cash flows. We will go to the black shoals. Uh, of course, we'll have a session separately on options pricing we've also had in the past. So here we'll just see that the spot price uh, will have to be computed for the, uh, you know, uh, for the equity shares. Time to maturity is the time up till which the conversion option is open. So till the time the uh, holder has flexibility to exercise his option is the time to maturity, those many years. So it will be the valuation date till 30th September 2030 in this case. In certain cases, there could be a moratorium for exercising the conversion option. So in that case, what do you think will the life be? So say if my terms say that there is no conversion that can happen in the first three years of allotment, then what do you think is the life for conversion, for calculating value of conversion option? Eight and a half. Why eight and a half? Total 10 years. First three years, you cannot exercise. Yeah. So, so, what... so, so first three years, I have ignored. So that is the minimum period is uh, se uh, seven years. Maximum period is 10 years. So I took average of two. But why do we need an average? If the terms are very clear, that only in those seven years, you can exercise. But at any then... point of time, right? It's at any point of time. That is then you can use binomial model for that. Take care of the life. In fact, yeah. Black-Scholes is also started averaging out. So if you see the Black-Scholes models, it's already averaging out the life. So, okay, according to me, it will be exactly seven years because your you will start, your exercise option will only start after the third year or the first day of the fourth year up till the 10th year. So seven, seven years is what you should consider. Why I will consider? Because my option pricing models will take care of the averaging of the life. Yeah, so I think... 10 plus 7, we are arbitrarily increasing the life and thus the value of the option, which we should not do. All but, right, but, again, my view, but, you may have practically implemented it otherwise, yeah. Okay, so in, in those cases, you have to exclude uh, the year spent in moratorium. Risk-free rate, how do you take that? That will generally be corresponding to the life of the option. So if six, you know, if 10 years is the life, then you take uh, Indian government, if you are doing a, an Indian company valuation, then you do a 10-year government of 
in their bond yield and get the risk free rate so that will always be corresponding to the life of the option so if the life you, of the instrument is more than 10 years is, uh, say uh, 20 years then also we can take a 10 years uh, uh, government check rate but you have 20 years also no government bond is available for 20 years also Okay, yeah, you can take. <clears throat> so uh, once you obtain the value of option, we can uh, add this value uh, to the value of the debentures and get the value of OCDs. All right. So uh, all valuations will have um, what we say, some option imbibed in them. Uh, they are totally dependent on the terms of the agreement. And these terms will form basis of valuation to be undertaken by us. At times in the share price agreements uh, or share purchase agreements, there are call and put options provided to parties to a transaction. Can you mute yourself, please? Yeah, so there are various conditions which are unpredictable as of the valuation date, but which are required to be uh, fulfilled to pay future considerations. So this, employ uh, this you know, implies that we have to factor the contingencies in our workings. And in such cases, we will have to run option pricing models uh, in practical experience, Monte Carlo uh, simulation model is the most suitable, uh, you know, pricing model for these kind of situations because it can give you numerous associated payoffs and probabilities. It will give you various outputs over a period of time, and the average of these several outputs will finally be considered as the final outcome. Okay. One more question. Uh, yes. See, uh, if, if you are not able to um, derive the, the spot price, like means, uh, uh, if we uh, calculate it by NAV, then it's a negative, and the projections are also not available, then in that case, we can consider the face value as a spot price. Is that uh, possible? If you're issuing anything, then yes. Anyways, companies are just saying that, yes, you know, your face value is the minimum value. You can't issue at a discount or at negative value for sure. Right. So face and, value and, and, can be taken. And if we are calculating this for a financial reporting purpose? For financial reporting, um, I would have taken it at face value because, you know, if there is an option involved, but currently your value is negative or for lack of business plans, you can take yes. face value. That's a safe approach to look. Oh, thanks. Okay. So how will you take the current value of the underlying asset? We'll just discuss all the, the spot price here. Okay, we'll just discuss all the elements in brief. So you can consider it as the market price of the underlying shares. Uh, either it is, if it's a listed company, it will already be there on stock exchanges uh, at the you know close of business hours as of the valuation date. Uh, but if the company's shares are not listed, then you have to compute it using uh, valuation methods, say DCF, CCM, CTM, et cetera, depending on the nature of the business of the company and other specifics. Uh, Risk-free rate. You can see uh, the screen I have used uh, and uh, plotted the risk-free rates. So they can be considered as the bond yield on government securities uh, for the maturity corresponding to the expected life of the option. Next is uh, life to expiration that we have already seen. That's the expected life of the option or time to maturity. The other important part is volatility. So volatility is a primary determinant in valuing options. So there are two types, historical and implied volatility. So basically historical volatility will see the price movements in terms of past performance. And it's calculated using the standard deviation uh, of the underlying asset. Uh, stocks will typically have uh, volatility between 15 to 60%. Okay, so to estimate the volatility, again, you, you we have a specific format and a formula, you can take the stock price uh, at fixed intervals. So say every day or a week or a month. And then the time period for this particular purpose should be exactly equal to the time period that we are considering for calculating the value of the option. Okay. So this is uh, with regards to volatility. So, so, yes. so, so implied volatility. So generally we determine based upon historical data, so yeah. how do we capture in the implied uh, no, implied volatility? Because that gives you more accurate picture as compared to the historical data. That is more? Uh, give you more accurate accurate picture because historically okay. we, we don't know that that will you know keep on reporting, especially during COVID time, right? Uh, you know, we had a lot of moments happen uh, in last three to four years. So so the volatility would be quite higher as, uh, you know, relatively if we compare uh, at least recent four, five years or maybe seven years down the line. Okay. Because we have 
so how to capture in the implied volatility i abhi i mean specifically we also use historical uh, volatility only so anybody in the group who has used implied volatility or you know used other sources to capture volatility maybe they can enlighten us um not right now or at the end of the session we can wait for a minute for somebody to unmute and speak but uh, i have also taken you know unlisted comps to so save the comp companies listed then well and good you take other companies as well take an average uh, if you don't have comparables you take some unlisted companies uh, you know with which is in the same peer group and uh, compute volatility uh, of the listed companies otherwise the third option is to take the index the index itself can also be considered if you have if you don't have enough historical data so that is what that's the approach we follow if anybody is using other sources to compute volatility then you know you can share with the group here anyone who's used a different approach to compute volatility I think no one is would like oh. to volunteer. Uh huh. Okay, maybe we'll we'll take this up. I think we can speak at the end. Um, uh, at that time people will come. You know, they'll have their questions, and you know that is where we can discuss. Okay, so uh, so say there is a company which is a public entity. It does not have enough historical data, or uh, on the price of its publicly traded shares, or uh, or other instruments. and as a valuer if i have reasons to believe that you know sufficient company specific information regarding volatility of the share price uh, is there then i can take it uh, uh, as a base to compute volatility uh, <clears throat> i can uh, if the if the company is unlisted like i said we can select a peer group and we can compute volatility of the peer group and apply it or else even if i don't have sometimes a company is extremely niche and you know there is you know there is no peer group available then we can also take a larger index to get the volatility okay so this is the volatility that we've done for each time the natural logarithm of the ratio of the stock price at the end of the time period and the stock price at the beginning of the time period is calculated and then the volatility is estimated as the standard deviation um and usually the days when the exchanges are closed they are ignored in measuring time for valuation for volatility calculation purposes one more element that is the dividend yield that you can compute uh, as an average of certain historical years or it can be based on future estimates as well in our in our example dividend is zero otherwise if there is dividend you should use it to uh, in your pricing model right so the value of the ocd here in this case is uh 100 per ocd and plus value of the option of 840 we have used a black scholes pricing model here to get the final fair value per ocd of inr 940 uh there is one more important uh, method which is the backsolve method for valuation of convertible instruments uh this back solve uh, asim uh, apeksha will also be taking in the next session right yeah in so, fact the next session is entirely devoted to back solve yeah right so should i just brush through or skip it yeah yeah no i better you brush through no it's okay 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 yeah so i'll just give you an overall glance and for uh, you know <laughs> for more queries we can reach out to apeksha in our next session so uh, right now you know uh, with so much structuring and complexity is involved we've seen that companies are issuing so many different types of securities and esops so this uh, the this particular method that is the back solve has become so much, so important and significant uh, now especially in startup valuations or especially in um, you know companies which have different uh, levels of uh, securities with different waterfall structures or uh, tranches so it's it's become a misnomer that the value of the preference share of a startup uh, is same as the value of its equity share this is uh, not correct because each instrument and each series of the instrument will have different rights and different preferences so this uh, it's also called as a subject company transaction method the backsolve method and as the name suggests whatever transaction the company has 
undertaken, you know, any funding route that the company has undertaken, if you uh, try to iterate and get the value of all the instruments based on that funding round itself, that is called as a backsort. Okay, so you're trying, you're using a backward approach to get the value of all the instruments of the company at present. So the backsort method will be applicable when the company has uh, recently undertaken a funding transaction at an arm's length trans, uh, you know, um, uh, pricing between two parties. Uh, it is considered to be a reliable indicator of the current value because it benchmarks the original issue price of the company's latest funding transaction. Okay, because original issue price is generally uh, negotiated between two parties. So we can consider that to be a fair value. Now, what is so peculiar about Backsolve is that it's based on the uh, Black-Scholes option pricing model. It is based on the rights and preferences of all the share classes on the capitalization table and the price per share of the recent finance. So say there is a recent um, series C, uh, you know, preferred funding that has happened. Then that particular tranche or that particular funding round will be considered along with the rights and preferences of all shares and classes to get the value of the various tranches of shares. Now, in this method, um, as I said, it's called backsolve. So this methodology backsolves to a value uh, for the company based on recent financing, and it will help in benchmarking the original issue price of the company's recent funding by first computing the value. So the first step is to calculate the overvalue of the company. The second step is to understand the rights and preferences of every individual tranche or every individual class or series of preference shares. And the third uh, step is to allocate that value as per step one in all the instruments as per step two, right? So here, if you see the box, it says these are the types of securities. So series A, A1, B, common stock and ESOPs. Uh, below that, we have the, the key details of every instrument. So we have the date of allotment, the estimated date of exit. Now, what do you mean by date of exit? So suppose the company has uh, issued class C or series C, you know, equity shares to a foreign investor. He may want to exit once there is an IPO or he may want to exit in say March, 2024, whichever is earlier. So that becomes the date of exit for this particular instrument. This, these details are available or you have to make them take them from the management for every class of security. <clears throat> then you get the difference, you get the conversion price. Generally, even the conversion price is mentioned in your agreement. Liquidation preference and considering a particular IRR is also uh, given. You can compute the conversion ratio and number of shares will also be given. After this, you need to understand what are the participation rights of every instrument. Why? Because when you do the Backshul's option pricing model, you will need you know, every trigger point will become the exercise price for you for Black Shoals option pricing model. Okay, so each security is contracted to carry some unique rights and preference shares can either have economic rights. Uh, what do you mean by economic rights? Economic rights are, you know, generally uh, all the rights which will affect the value of the security. So they can either have economic rights. So economic rights can be liquidation preference, conversion rights and participation rights. These are the three kinds of economic rights available to uh, holders with securities having economic rights, okay? Then there are some non-economic rights also, like, you know, you have voting right, you will have a seat in the board of the directors, you will have access to the books of accounts. So they, they again, they may, you know, uh, affect cash flows to some extent, but economic rights are more important. It is important to understand these uh, liquidation preference, and conversion right and participation rights. Why? Because they all form the exercise price when you are doing the black shoal option pricing model. Okay, after you fill in for all the tranches, this has to be done. You will have something called as a waterfall analysis. So what is that? The preferences and rights of the various securities which help in determining the various breakpoints of valuation. Okay, and these breakpoints are nothing but equity values when different classes of shares uh, get their values. So why do we need uh, OPM 
OPM is required when you are allocating equity value between various classes of shares like equity, preference, ESOPs, etc. We can also use uh, OPM or the option pricing model for uh, you know future possible outcomes when it is very difficult to predict. And so the projections could be unreliable to use in these cases. Okay, the method helps to calculate the value of the securities depending on their rights and preferences like you know liquidation preference, participation, exit rights, and other economic rights. So this is what Backsolve is essentially used for. Ultimately, you can apply some lack of uh, you know marketability and discount for lack of control depending on what exactly which stake are you exactly valuing. So this is the back solve process, analysis of the capital structure of the company. Then you do the waterfall analysis. You have to run the back black shows option pricing model to get the value of various classes of instruments. Okay, so this is an example uh, again on the OCD valuation. You all can tell me how you would have valued it. We have a face value per OCD. This is per OCD one crore. The number of OCDs issued are 1125. Issue price uh, is uh, 1125 crores. The tenure of the OCD is 61 months from the closing date. The option of conversion or redemption, convertible, and if it is not converted, then they are redeemable at a sum equivalent of its investment amount, that is 11250 million, plus the unpaid accrued coupon till date of redemption. The coupon rate of the OCDs is 5% per annum. Okay, then there are some terms as to how it will accrue on the USD equivalent. The accrual period is given up to the conversion date. And then upon conversion, there, will, there is some more term. Conversion is at the option of the OCD holder. Okay, then they have given a conversion ratio or a formula, which is 273.6448 per equity share. They are transferable and they are categorized as debt. How do you think you will value this? I'm just giving an example of a mid-level complicated case. So here the OCDs are convertible securities and its value will come uh, you know, from its equity shares. And of course, if they are redeemable, then it's the equivalent of its investment amount plus the unpaid accrued coupon. Um, here we have analyzed three methods uh, or three scenarios. Uh, so we have seen that, you know, as per one option, uh, that is the redemption option, we are getting one value. As per the second option, that is the conversion, we are getting the second value. And there was a recent infusion that had happened. So that becomes the third option. So the fair value that we have taken is highest of the three. Okay. So we have taken highest of the three. This is another way of valuing OCDs when you have various you know, complexities involved in the conversion and redemption scenarios. All right, so higher of conversion or redemption. And if nothing happens, and as per replacement cost, anyways under Companies Act, you have to issue it at a minimum of face value. So this becomes the value of the OCDs. Okay, so this is just, uh, this is just the calculation of how we got you know, the complexities, not, not relevant. But I would just like to show you the detailing that can be done to, to get the value, right? So based on all the methodologies, uh, we have come to a conclusion that the value is uh, 1 crore per OCD, which is the highest of the value under the various scenarios. That is the redemption option, conversion option, and the price of recent investment method. There is a CCPS, which has a fixed conversion ratio. Okay. So again, they have given uh, investment amount. Then they are saying that uh, this is a series B. And if they are saying that if the series B does not occur, then the bridge share price will be at least 51.53 rupees uh, per share price. So they are asking us to value the say per series A1 CCPS value. Now, there were many more things to the terms and there were you know uh, projections involved. And after detailed working, we could interpret that the only uh, scenario that will actually materialize is the second one. That is that if series B does not occur, then the bridge share price will be 51.53. The others were not holding good. So when these kind of uh, terms are provided to you, 
you have to assess every term builds pro scenarios you know probably scenario 1 the value is this scenario 2 the value is this and then you can also apply weightages if you don't want to take highest of all three so you can also apply weightages to every scenario so in this case since the conversion ratio was fixed as 1 is to 1 we took the fair value per equity share we applied a conversion ratio to get the series a1 ccps value Okay, this is a evaluation of CCPS again, where the conversion price is fixed. So they have given a fixed conversion price. So I have also marked it in bold. So here it's mentioned that the series A to CCPS will be converted at a price of one zero three point zero six zero eight. Okay, so here and then they have given that this is the discounted price and series B financing. There'll be there'll be various terms. Okay, we should we should use all of them, and then we should arrive at a final value. So here we took that fair value per equity share is this. This is the conversion price, and so the fair value of CCPS series A two is two hundred. Okay, how did I get one point point nine four? The computation is given down. The total proposed funding amount is given. Conversion price is given, right? So the number of equity shares to be received upon conversion, I get that. Th that is uh, the proposed funding amount divided by the conversion price. Then I get the number of CCPS series A two that is proposed to be issued. Okay, and finally the conversion ratio for one CCPS series A two, <coughs> sorry, is equal to the number of equity shares to be received on conversion divided by the number of CCPS to be issued. So this one point nine four, which is the conversion ratio, is applied to the fair value per equity share to get the value of CCPS series A two. we we'll now go through some of the the challenges like we had so many queries uh, you know in the, in the beginning of the session so I think uh, one of the major challenge of convertible bonds is to find uh, an efficient pricing method which is consistent with the observed market prices there are several questions that need to be addressed when you are valuing convertible bond pricing models so first is um, you know the the observed convertible bond it needs to be categorized uh you know as they have to be considered as input to the pricing function while plain vanilla bonds uh, they can be you know easily uh, justified and easily the value can be easily determined but where there are other features then you have to explicitly build those in the pricing functions as a valuer you need to ensure that uh, the pricing models need to include all the relevant risk factors like i showed the idea was not to sit and compute but the idea was to give a sense of what is the complexity that can be involved you know there can be uh, options there can be conversion price given and then there can be some scenarios that have been built so all of that have to be uh, you know these hybrid characteristic type of bonds they have to you know capture uh, to, to the these features have to get captured to get the final value and in terms of extremely complex models you may have to use the binomial tree models or the black shoes models or the monte carlo simulation methods um then i also think that you know uh, like unlike for equities or businesses where we can corroborate our findings with other valuation methods um it can be difficult uh, to corroborate our findings in case of convertibles because the methods are extremely fixed in this case and every method is you know it's either straight or it's very complex so even comparing two values using one one straight and one complex method could give us different results uh then i think uh, as valuers we will need to possess some databases uh, accesses to databases like bloomberg or fimda for getting accurate inputs which form part of the discount rate so um uh, yes so this was about the key challenges that i i have seen you know getting faced and i personally faced as well with this i'll go through a brief concept checker where i'll need inputs from you i'll give you the terms of the instrument and you have to give me not the final figure or the computation but an approach that you think will be uh, or can be used for specifically valuing this ocd okay you can unmute and then speak or you can write on the chat box um before going ahead i have one question yes. uh, in case of a uh, fixed income uh, that instrument will have to have the uh, follow the guidelines of fimda or means uh, we can uh, take a uh, risk free rate plus uh, some uh, margin and, and yeah no no you it's not necessary you use fimda 
you okay. can use other methods to get your discount rate. Okay. So the face value of each of the OCDs is INR. Um, because of this box, I can't see. Uh, uh, INR uh, 1 lakh. The OCDs will not carry any interest until 31st March 2024. And post which the company and the investor will mutually agree on the interest payable on the OCDs. It is clarified that no interest will be due and payable if the OCDs are converted or redeemed at any time prior to 31st March 24. The term of the OCDs will be 10 years from 3rd September 2021. The OCDs will be converted into equity shares at any time at the fair value of the equity shares of the company at the sole discretion of the investor. The OCDs shall be redeemable at any time at the sole discretion of the investor at par okay at par if the ocds are not converted into equity shares or redeemed on or before the expiry of the ocd term in accordance with the paragraph which was mentioned in the terms then immediately upon the expiry of the ocd term the company will redeem the ocds at par so what do you think is the valuation approach that can be used in this case Under redemption option, what do you think is the value? Right. So under redemption option, it is very clearly mentioned. Come what may, it will at any point in time, if I do it before, after, you know, if conversion does not happen, whatever happens, it will always be at par. So the redemption amount is fixed of 1 lakh. Under conversion option, what do you think? <clears throat> so these are some other details. The, this is the second instrument. Yeah. So yeah, what happens? See, it's like it's pretty much like the first, uh, I think, example that we did. Yes. Conversion option value is nil, but you it is it's at the fair value of the equity shares, right? And it is at the sole discretion of the investor. So obviously, investor will select whenever it is most beneficial to him. So we leave it to the FMV of the shares at the time. So in my practical understanding, the value will remain at 1 lakh. Because under both options, you will get the same value. Okay, if every, anybody has a different view, please feel free to share. This is a second exercise. There are CCDs, okay? And each CCD is having a value of... Uh, 1 lakh. It has a coupon of 8% payable annually. Uh, conversion option says that CCD can be converted at any time on or before maturity. Okay. And the maturity period is three years from date of issuance. They have given the annual coupon of 8% and face value of each CCD of INR 1 lakh. The maturity period is three years. So it can be at any time on or before maturity. Anyone? So, like I said, again, we that could have run. Coupon rate plus uh, the present value of uh, the conversion value that is this one. Like. I did not get you. Sorry. Present value of coupon and uh, plus the present value of uh, the conversion. Yeah, that is, that, that is right. The approach is correct. But since they are giving that, you know, at any year, uh, actually, it was at any year end, uh, not at any time. So if it's at any year end, then I will, I have seen it for all the three years. And then I have discussed with the management, you know, that what is the likelihood that you will convert it in one year or, or your, you know, the investor will convert it in the second year or the third year. And I've assigned weightages. Other approach would be to give an equal weightage to all three. That is a very safe approach to use. But if, yeah, the terms are such that, you know, you can do it at any any of the year endings or any of the specific fixed points, then you have to build in scenarios to get the value of the CCDs. All right, then these are option pricing models, but uh, since Apeksha will be taking it, I'm not taking it right now. And we can, we can just leave the flow for questions now. And let's have some discussion so that anybody else who's valued things differently, you know, they can also share their thoughts.
in in the example that i've just shared anybody so do you all value or uh, you know it in a similar fashion or uh, you know anything that is being done differently by all in the last scenario the, the case we have discussed uh, in uh, in such situation uh, i have uh, taken the uh, i took the maximum uh, the tenure the 3 years only okay. uh, I, i don't calculate it uh, year wise and then give averages so is that uh, the correct correct way? I, I, i'm not sure uh see it's on your term if it is saying that it will happen only at end of year 3 then you are right then you don't have to you know assess your one year two but if the terms are saying that it can happen on year one and also year two and also year three and also then you will have to do it for all three years and you have to but, assign a probability to but it. sometimes uh, terms are like that it can uh, means uh, uh, it can be convertible uh, uh, in any uh, any point of time and during that particular uh, not at the end of one year or two year three year then in uh, that case uh, how then do... at that time you should use monte carlo method because in monte carlo it will give you various uh, you know you put the exercise period as 3 years and in between 3 years it's flexible it can happen at any point in time or you can use binomial also in those all steps it uh, you know your time period fluctuations will get covered okay yeah any more questions anything to discuss anything that you all have done differently i'm happy to hear yeah asim i think we don't have any questions uh, or inputs so shall we end the session then yeah yeah if if you don't have anything more i mean uh, we can end it that's fine yeah yeah okay ab uh, i think uh, harshil patel had wanted to discuss something no his his questions have been solved because he was saying something he will discuss at the end of the session uh yeah harshil you have any questions i think he just spoke na harshil tha na acha shanil is saying where can we get valuation reports on option pricing which uh, valuation reports are you referring to as in valuation reports or valuation models Shanil, what are you referring to? Can you give some more details? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, so just wanted to know for reference, like if suppose we are using, uh, 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 we are uh, doing valuation on option pricing model for some companies. Uh, like for reference, how do we get to know how other people are doing valuation on? Uh, Oh. Uh, so there are such do we get such kind of inputs from any uh, any uh, books or any uh, uh, material oh. from uh yeah books uh, i don't know i have only referred to hull uh, generally john hull and uh, if there is some you will get some you know some data or some relevant models even on internet where you can see how things are done with formulae so i think that but from other valuers i don't think i have obtained uh, asim have you got anything how other valuers operate or what they have no so normally you know if uh, you are helping the audit team then some sometimes you do come across third party valuation reports otherwise on on the net like let's say we have something from damodara and we don't get that much detail on yeah. option uh, valuation Okay, okay, and do we get any valuation uh, reports from MGT fourteen, like any uh, ROC forms, uh, where there have. there is a mandate to submit the valuation report? See, you will not get reports, but if you refer to these AI CPA guidelines, because see, these kind of exotic instruments have been in uh, uh, you know operation since long in uh, US and Singapore US, and all. Yeah. So there, you can get quite some good examples about you know how certain instruments should be valued. I mean, they may not be valuation reports, but at least they will give full-fledged detailed examples. Okay, okay, thank you. And uh, I think yeah, that also reminds that if you like uh, in continuation to what Asim is saying, if you even see their annual reports, they 
will they detail out generally you know how they um, price the options what are the assumptions they have used so i think all that data is also extensively uh, uh, provided in their annual reports okay okay thank you harshil you acha anybody uh, has any clue on implied volatility and how reliable it is to use then you can just share your views here because i think that was a question which harshil had Yeah, so we have been always using historical volatility only, either of the companies or of yeah, the index. Hmm. So that's what we have also used. But uh, uh, Harshil, I have your question in mind. I mean, I will, I'll, I'll, we'll do some more. Uh, you know, we'll just study that and see if what I can get and send it across to you. Can you throw some light on the weightage that you, we have used in the sense? Uh, um i have faced a similar issue while uh, valuing let's say a non compete agreement mm -hmm. okay so uh, the probability of how or when the person might leave or the chances of his leaving so if i want to put a weightage over that in the last case that we have uh, taken weightage so can can you throw some light on what factors would affect obviously it would be individual specific case and we'll have to discuss with the management but then any specific uh, factors that we should keep in mind in assessing that probability yeah so while you are speaking of something different so you know uh, that whether the employee leaves or not or the shareholder exits or not that is what chances are you know there that he will actually uh, get a competing business so that is probably different from uh, the scenario here that right anything that you whether the investor is getting an optimal conversion price at year one <clears throat> so i'll say at the back of the hand what we had done is we assessed the cash flows and we saw okay. that in which of the three years was he getting maximum benefit okay so in 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 okay particularly that was our primary driving factor and then we took cues from the management as well because the investor and the management were obviously in discussion with each other though it was at arm's length but so we took cues from the parties as well so i think uh, a combination of factors uh, will be helpful to actually give you a probability or assign a weightage okay yeah. Yeah, then we can uh, uh, put a light on uh, what are the statutory requirement of the, uh, the 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 valuation of the uh, the fixed uh, instrument uh, or it, it can be done by registered valuer or uh, any other valuer so when you are issuing uh, any of these instruments to an indian or uh, to you know an, an indian company is issuing then you need to do it under companies act okay and if you are issuing it to a foreign party you also have to take care of fema compliances which can be signed by a ce or a merchant banker anything done by a, a companies under companies act is by a registered valuer if you are transferring something you have to take care of section 56 to 10 rule 11 ua where you will uh, do these for 11 ua 1 cc that's the guiding uh, you know income tax rule where you know you can value the instrument using any fair valuation technique that can be done again by a ca or a merchant banker so only under companies act it's a registered valuer statutory requirement for fema and for income tax for these not for uh, you know not that 56 to 7b but yeah for these kind of instruments a ca also can a practicing ca can also sign okay thank you hi rashmi uh, uh, probably a very lame question might be uh, i just wanted to understand like when we are doing the valuation for optional ocds in that case uh, do we uh, so if we are make, doing under income approach Uh, do we consider that as a debt and uh, uh, identify the value per share, or do we go with the equity share? We consider that to be as good as share capital. Then, good. How does it generally go? No, no, no. So when we are doing OCD, uh, you take one part of the uh, the overall value is uh, debt. You take it like debt. The other part of the OCD is the value of conversion. So in a scenario, if you have to convert that OCD. what is the value you get you have to add both of these to get the value of the oc 
So right. assuming it to be part of debt is only one part of the overall OC. The second part is the value of the option to convert. If I have the option to convert, what is the extra benefit that I'm getting? And okay. that is arrived at using a uh, options pricing model. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Any more questions? All right. So, Rashmi, on behalf of the group, I would like to uh, propose a vote of thanks. Uh, as you are aware, you know, this was a long awaited session. And, yeah. you know, obviously, a um, uh, sought after topic also. If you remember, we had asked for the participants, uh, you know, views yeah. as to which topic should be uh, taken. And most of them had wanted to, you know, be part of this session. So, thanks for doing uh, justice to the topic. Uh, you know, whenever you get time, you can share the presentation on the group, right? Yeah. I already asked uh, Subhash to share the recording also because one or two sure. people had requested that. Sure. But uh, thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, everyone. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Rasmi. It was really nice. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. I'll share the presentation. Uh, Asim, I'll just, uh, you know, sanitize the presentation of it. Uh, wherever we have uh, uh, you that know, is all right. That's fine. Client data and all, we'll remove that and then I'll share it. Yes. Huh? Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks all. Yeah.